And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to... Coming to us from the from the weird and wonderful world of the Endeavor Universal Role Playing Game, which which managed to get funded in about a day, and one of the rare cases of of a case where I don't have to play Time Zone Hell, <laughs> the one and only <laughs> Nick. Don't call him Dirty Callahan. Well, thank you for the the fabulous introduction there. I feel I feel honored. So. Now, as I as I understand it, Endeavor is a universalist um, role playing game. But let's start at the humble beginnings, as we often do. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Yes, I, I actually have a very specific kind of example I can give that I remember. Um, a very close friend I've known since I was about ten years old, and he. Uh, he traveled a lot as a kid, so I saw him like intermittently. But um, when we were about twelve or thirteen, uh, he was living in Mexico, and I went down for a week on my like uh, Thanksgiving break right from school to go um, to go visit to go visit him. Right? And he had gotten into RPGs. It was uh, Dungeons Dragons Fourth Edition, right? And like when that was early, when that was like, kind of early on, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he had just got into RPGs. I was I was dubious of it. I didn't I didn't really get it initially. Um, but he's like, okay, I'll, I'll I'll sell you on it, right? He gave me the fourth edition monster manual, right? Uh, and I read that entire thing over the course of the trip. Um, and then when we when he came back to the states and when we were both, there, I was like, okay, we have to we have to try it. We have to try RPGs, right? We have to try like D and D, so we really played that for a long time, like Dungeons and Dragons, and then we started branching out to other systems uh, after that. And once once the floodgates opened on that, you know, it, the floodgates were open, right? We we started playing all kinds of games, mm -hmm. um, and I've never really stopped since. It's it's been, you know, one of my biggest like main hobbies that I do, right? Uh, ever since then, pretty much. Yeah, and. It is interesting that for, that 4E was the entry point, given how I've nicknamed that game the RPG I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because I wasn't paid. <laughs> yeah, I 4E is kind of a weird thing, because I only... I don't know, I, I feel like I don't have a, a very... Um, I can't have an unbiased opinion on that game because I only played it when I was a kid, mm -hmm. right? Or like, an early, like a young teenager. Uh, I, I, play, I don't play as very much... D, D these days, right? So that'd probably be something I'd, I'd want to go back to in the future and see maybe is is it what I remember it being? Um, yeah. But it is kind of it is kind of funny, yeah. The the very hated on edition is the one I what I started with. Well, I've I've always argued that that edition is over hated. Uh, to by that I mean people aren't hating on it specifically; they're hating on a. Um, impression of an impression of it. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a bandwagon to to Tatum and Forey like got popular too. Mm -hmm. And well, that that in the MMO com, com, um, remark that I often hear never yeah. never really never really stuck with me because of how how um, once you want. Once you try and put a, a little bit of scrutiny with any MMO experience, it just falls flat on its face. Oh, I see what you mean with the impression thing. It's it's what it seems to be similar to what people think MMOs are like, right? Yeah, you know, the, right. It's it's more the it's more the idea the idea of it. Um, I saw mm -hmm. a similar thing with the hate boner that some had for. Call for Call of Duty during the 360 era, dur during what's referred to as the good years, um, but the but it was so non-specific about what the problem was that uh, that I was like, 
are you are you hating on the game or are you hating on the idea of the game that you've made in your head? Yeah. No, I can absolutely understand that. Mm -hmm. Now, in the About Us on the Kickstart, you talk about being dissatisfied with generalist systems commonly offered. So I'm, I'm curious what sort of generalist or universalist systems you had encountered in the, in the past that left you dissatisfied in what and how you tried to address that with Endeavor. Yes, I mean, the three main ones I played, to varying degrees, is Fate, Savage Worlds, and um, GURPS. Right? Mm -hmm. And to me, it was different things for each game, um, but they just didn't quite click with me. Well, let's go. Let's go with them. Let's go with them one by one. I can. I've had my own criticisms with fate, but I can. But what was your dissatisfaction with fate? We'll start with that one, since that's the simplest one, technically. Yeah. So I should say I don't. Fate. There are definitely games like like there. Are, there's also varying degrees of dissatisfaction. Like fate definitely has a use case for a lot of games, right? It's just, for me, the thing about Fate is Fate has something that I dislike in RPGs personally, right? Which is um, mechanics that aren't actually different from character to character. Right? Like, you have, like, they're all, uh... God, how should I say this? A stunt, like, for example, in Fate, like, a stunt in Fate, right? Mm -hmm. Is, you can put any color of paint you want on it, but it, there are essentially four abilities in Fate, right? That can up just apply to different things. Right? Um, the way the skills work, the way everything is set up in Fate, it's very simple, it's very straightforward, and that is good for a lot of things, but Fate characters don't really feel meaningfully different from each other. Um, there's not... Different characters don't have different mechanics, or different, like, or really, I think, meaningfully different abilities, just arranged in different orders. And so it just felt like there was there was a lack of mechanical depth uh, that I personally I didn't appreciate. Yeah, and of, um, of course, yeah, I can art I can already hear the it's about the story cr crowd re re reading at me in the background, which is a bit is is I've always looked at that kind of thinking as a as a band aid. Because at the end of the day, you're not writing a story; you're playing a game. Hmm. Oh. The thing, I... oh, God. I will note that the big issue that I I brought up in the past with Fate was the lack of guidance when it came to aspects. Mm -hmm. I can turn in terms of what in terms of what is going too far with a aspect and what isn't because. For all intents and purposes, the aspect system is a blank check. And when you have yeah. that kind of blank check, it's important to give some kind of guidance. That is, that is something I definitely encountered when I played Fate, and I, I have played a lot of Fate. But um, that's something it, you see in several systems. Any system that has something similar to aspects, right, where it's invoking a thing in exchange for a bonus, uh, is the, the GM haggling. I kind of call it right, mm -hmm. where it's you know you you're trying to well actually it does make sense in this to get the plus two in this scenario because X Y and Z right yeah you know, people and fairly people naturally try to stretch what they have right and remove resources as far as they can right and it, it does kind of tend to lead to that um I think any system that has that type of you know that type of setup does have that to an extent but. I, I do suit you mean Faye, where it's it's they don't really give much guidance on what like how far you should be able to stretch it or like what the limiting factors should be on it. Mm -hmm. And the my counterpoint with my counterpoint with all that is the one unique thing in Thirteenth Age where there's a two page spread that goes into good and bad examples and why. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, there's not a, there's not as much mechanical weight to the one unique thing, but it is still a blank check. Mm. But mo that, moving on from that, there's also Savage Worlds, which you had 
had said that you had issues. And is is it a similar issue to the characters mechanically feel too similar, or is it a di- or is it a different um, uh, satisfaction th- for for Savage Worlds? Very much, um, it, it's very much a similar issue. In fact, I Savage Worlds I almost feel is worse, right? In that Savage Worlds, like Fate, at least. Like here's the thing about fate, right? Is that I, I felt like there wasn't any weight to them. Uh, they felt like there was a lack of weight to the mechanics because they most of the mechanics are most things a character can have are just the same several mechanics that can be reskinned. It's so open that you can just do whatever you want with it, and there's some value in that. Savage Worlds, I, I had a lot of issues with because it felt like characters were not meaningfully different. Um. And also, there was a lot more restrictions in place, right? Like, there's a limited selection of things you can choose from. Mm-hmm. And the things you can choose from don't feel like they change your character that much. Um, Savage Worlds, I think, especially have the problem with the... Because you have the wild die, right? Uh, a character can never really be that bad at something in Savage Worlds. And also being really good at something isn't that different from being bad at it. So it just, it just felt like, yeah, it felt like if you have three characters that are good at different things, they don't perform that much differently in a mechanical sense. Like, your only difference, like, your most major difference is just your role play. Mm-hmm. Um, which, any game, you can, you role play differences, you're obviously going to role play differences because you're playing a different person. But, you know, the system should support the fact, in my opinion, that the player characters are different people, right, with different capabilities. That's something I, I focused a lot when I was writing Endeavor, was making, char- you can make two characters in Endeavor that do completely different things and are, com- and like, have a lot of capabilities, right, that other players do not or that other characters do not, right, mm-hmm. um, and have them act and play very, very differently. Uh, moving on to GURPS, actually, uh, if, I, if I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, GURPS, GURPS, I think, actually had the, didn't have that problem. GURPS has the, the, like, GURPS has the mechanics, right? GURPS is a very mechanically in-depth game. I, I did appreciate that when I was playing it. Um, my problem was anything was that it went a bit too far in the opposite direction, I felt, where uh, setup for that, setup for GURPS is very difficult, especially with certain types of games. You have to do a lot of prep, um, and there's just a lot of bookkeeping, right? especially uh, just because of the way the points system works for making characters. Um, even for like a human level character, it takes a while. And for you know, I played like a superhero game once, the GURPS, right? And it took like five hours to make a character, right? You know, mm-hmm. because. You have to just try ma- manually track everything, and then if you're making like your villain, right? A lot of the times you have to go through that same process. So I felt GURPS as a game, as a in terms of game design, I think GURPS is the best of them. Um, but I think it does have a problem with being unwieldy and slow to play, which is again something I really tried to address in Endeavor. Yeah, GURPS is very front loaded, and I know some people will swear by its. Um, bell curve, but the fact of the matter is, you need multiple session zeros for it. Yeah. And once and once the expansion books come come in, then it becomes less of a game and more of a cry for help. <laughs> yeah, I have I have a buddy that very much is uh, yeah, I'd say like he's Gerp's strongest soldier, right? Um, but. You know, I think I think I think it just says like I my friend a uh, friend of mine who is like you know the biggest like GURPS fan I know right uh, stopped running his GURPS game because it was too much prep right like so that I think that kind of says something yeah um, I will admit that I will admit my own biases I like giving GURPS um, stalwarts a, bu- a bunch of crap for the insistence that the insistence that keeps getting thrown at me of oh you can use GURPS to run anything. Mm-hmm. Which, technically speaking, is correct. Practically speaking, is another matter entirely. Yeah, the, the thing about it is, I don't, I don't doubt you can run anything with GURPS. Like, I, I 
I believe that. Right? I like GURPS 100%, I think, succeeds at its goal, which is being the game that you can use to run anything, right? It's just, I think, mechanically speaking, GURPS at high levels is at high, like, power levels is cumbersome and at low power levels can be kind of boring um, in terms of its mechanics. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say GURPS is, in my opinion, from a game design perspective, the best of the like three really big generalist systems that come to my head, yeah. right? You know, of, of Fate, Sav, Drills, GURPS. And I'm guessing you haven't messed around with, say, um, with, say, Hero System. That's about one or two times. That's just a, that's just some that's just a case of you know nobody might like the group that I played with really messed around with it much. So I never I've read through it a bit a long time ago, um, but kind of bounced. So I, I I can't really say too much on that because I'm not I'm not as familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And. There's a, there's a few others I can think of, but that that brings me to how that brings me to the other end of the equation is with each of these with each of the three that you mentioned, um, what did what did you what did you take that that is the satisfaction in, into in terms of how you'd handle it for um how you'd handle that particular issue with Endeavor? Yeah, so the main thing, like I said, the um. The main things I kind of wanted to focus on when I was making Endeavor, right? When I was looking at this, is okay. I want a system that can, you know, it can like my basically goals were okay. I want a system that can run pretty much anything that I put in front of it, right? You know, within you know, some some benchmarks, right? Uh, mainly being that the the system is not designed to support like superheroes, right? So. But anything below, you know, any, anything of relatively normal human power level, right? It can do pretty much anything, anything within that. Um, so that's the one thing I wanted. Second, I wanted something that had actual mechanical depth. And the big thing, I wanted characters to feel really different from each other based on how you spec them. And players to have, like, really different capabilities. Right? Um, that was one thing, just from a mechanics perspective... That's one thing, is the difference between a character that is has no skill at a task and has the maximum skill at a task is like is massive, right? Um that's something that happens in things like Savage Worlds or like a lot of D100 systems, right? Where it, you you basically can never guarantee a role or like guarantee that you can't succeed the role. Like there's always like a relatively decent chance, right? Just because of the way the dice system works. Endeavor, that's not true. You can get to roles where it's you straight up cannot do this, or you are guaranteed to do this, um, if you are like at a high enough skill level or have you know enough bonuses. Mm -hmm. um, a big part of that also was just adding a lot of abilities uh, to the game and giving them lots of options. The biggest one uh, and kind of the central one, the system is the heroic traits. Um, which are basically every, when you make a character, you pick your heroic trait. That's the first thing you do. Your character has that heroic trait. No one else will have that. Um, none of the other player characters will have that. The only other people that can have even a heroic trait, um, let alone yours, is, you know, your story villains, your big, bad, evil guys, right? Um, like those types of characters. Mm -hmm. And they have a very, very powerful and very... and in practical terms, you know, unreplicatable, right, ability, ability, right? That really changes how they play. So, like, I, the example I always give, because it's a very straightforward example, is uh, one of the heroic traits is Herculean Strength, right? Pretty yeah. easy to understand what that is, right? Uh, mechanic, what that does, it's a D6 dice pool system. Um, with Herculean Strength, you roll D8s, along with several other uh, miscellaneous bonuses. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, you're not, you know, you're not necessarily, you're not lifting a building, right? You're not necessarily super powered, but, you know, you're like fighting, you're like fighting bears in the woods and stuff like that, right? It's, it's that kind of, you know, urban legend level, like strength, right? Um, or another, like one of them is just straight up magic, right? You have magic powers, right? 
uh, you are like a wizard, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole rule section for that. Or you're psychic, or um, uh, one of them is like immensely lucky, right? Which lets you explode sixes, right? Or there's 30 of them, right? So there's a lot of them uh, for, you know, various various uses. Um, so it's pretty it's pretty hard to find to not find anything you like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was one of the biggest things I did was that was one of the things I started with was that heroic trait system. Um, because kind of something I thought about was okay if you have a if you have a game where all the player characters are doing are relatively doing the same job how do you make them different from each other and that is like that's what comes to me is give them something from the outset that this is something that makes you unique right and that completely changes your gameplay from you know from the other players mm -hmm. so that's the biggest thing um yeah in terms of making player characters distinct is just there's a wide variance in how capable characters are in various areas there's a uh, pretty much complete freedom in how you spec things like skills um, and stats. A point, it's a straight like XP point by right? uh, in terms of setting that up. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the heroic traits make it so that two, no two player characters can really be the same um, as long as they have two different heroic traits because they're so defining and so different from each other. Yeah, that that definitely makes sense and. One of the big problems that can happen with universalist games, whether you want to call it universalist or or um, gen or generalist, that's that's beyond, mm -hmm. that's beyond it, is the issue of analysis paralysis when it comes to the points you spend and how how wide the possible character pool is. Mm -hmm. With Endeavor, how do you address that particular issue? So it tends to run pretty straightforward uh, in my experience, mainly because, well, for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's broken up into segments, right? Uh, at character creation for a certain thing. Um, and the heroic traits tend to, that's something I think is actually a strength of the heroic traits, is that they really tend to inform character builds. A lot, so people pick their heroic trait first, and then a lot of this, and a lot of the at least initial stuff they pick in terms of like their skills, right, their stats, uh, tends to be very you know straightforward from that. Um, like obviously, right, if you're if you're you know killing strength, right, as a heroic trait, you're probably going to want to you know take some extra. You might want to take some extra in like strength or like boost your toughness or something to be you know, just kind of a physical powerhouse, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Or if you have, you know, another trait is a true scholar, which boosts all your knowledge rolls. Um, probably going to take uh, a bonus to your wits. I should say the the five there's five stats in the game. It's wits, willpower, strength, toughness, and dexterity. Um, so yeah, the heroic tends to inform a lot of the decisions, and it runs pretty smoothly because of that. Um, other than that. I think a good way I've, I've, I've when I've been running the game um, to people are explaining to them for the first time a good way to look at it is there's another set of abilities just called perks, uh, you know, pretty standard uh, RPG stuff, just set of you know extra abilities, right? It's almost 200 of those, and I something I, I often tell uh, players is okay, l just look at the perks you want, find the perks you want, and then just build your character so you meet the prerequisites for those. Um. And again, it usually runs pretty fast. Like if you're if someone's familiar with the game, it usually doesn't take more than you know ten fifteen minutes to make a character. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think that's a good call because well the well like we said before when in these kind of things when you can do just about anything, there's the issue of analysis paralysis and the issue of uh, having a having a um, character creation session zero that ends up lasting a lifetime. Yeah. No, I absolutely understand that. Um, that was something. Yeah, it, it ended up. I think from where it is, it's you know pretty straightforward, right? Just because when you have a kind of uh, a mechanic that forces you to kind of commit to a central concept at the outset, uh, it does tend to help with you know getting things uh, running. 
Mm -hmm. So with that in, with that in mind, um, what would you say is the core mechanic when it comes to resolution? Because there always needs to be an all roads lead to Rome in these kind of systems. So where where would you where would how would you descri describe the Rome in that sense? Yeah, so the way the dice system works, right? Um, for example, it's the base system is simple. So it's a d6 uh, dice pool for the most part. Again, some heroic traits make you boost your dice size, but for most characters, it's going to be d6s. And it's additive, not success based. So it's you roll them and add the numbers together, not uh, not you know looking for a success like something like chaperone. Um, the way it works, you have your stat. Uh, for most characters, stats are around three. Uh, you know, for like the standard kind of human stat lines, you know, three in every stat. Uh, then you can then you kind of finagle those from there. And basically, excuse me. Basically, you uh, start with the number of dice equal to your stat. Right, so you have a wits of three, and you're rolling a wits based roll. Then you start with 3d6, um, and you add your skill bonus to that, which is just a flat bonus, like plus 3, plus 6, plus 9. Mm -hmm. um, you roll that, right, and you, know, you roll that and get your total. The big thing uh, that is different from a lot of systems, all the systems have something similar to this, although from what I have seen, most are not as central to the, um, like, to the rolling mechanic as, as it is in this is the effort mechanic, mm -hmm. which is every character, they have a pool of effort um, that is determined by their stats. Uh, the way it works, every point of strength, willpower, and toughness you have, you get an extra effort. Mm -hmm. um, and you can get more from extra sources, too. Like some heroic traits give you more. You also get a bonus if you have high athletic skills. Uh, but yeah, you have a pool of effort. And... Whenever you make a roll, you can choose to spend, uh, if you want to spend effort on that, and if so, how much? Because you can spend uh, up to two effort on a roll. And each time you spend an effort, you add another d6 to the roll. Or a die, or just the die of the appropriate size, if you're rolling a, a different die size. Mm -hmm. um, so, average character, right, it's got a 3 and a stat. If they're spending no effort, they're rolling 3d6. Spending one effort, they're rolling 4d6. They're spending two effort, they're rolling 5d6. Uh, and the difference between not spending effort and spending effort is huge. Uh, most, the way the obstacles are, most characters will need to spend some effort to succeed tasks. If you're really good at something, you can you know you can pass a lot of tasks without spending effort. If you're really bad at something, then you're going to need to spend effort to even like have a chance. Um, and so management of that like effort pool is a big is a you know big gameplay mechanic that'll. It'll vary from game to game depending on your concept, right? In some games, you know, your players might be really scraping for effort, right? You know, and really looking to strategize about it. In some games, you know, maybe it's more role play centric game. You're not doing as much rolling. You know, effort's going to be more available. Um, but that, yeah, the effort mechanic is probably the biggest resolution thing, right? Most of the uh, game challenges are basically okay. Do you want to put effort into this? Because if you do, there's a good chance you can succeed, right? Um, characters in Endeavor tend to be they t the characters in Endeavor tend to be very confident, uh, not confident, competent. Mm -hmm. Um, and because of that, generally spending effort will let you succeed most of these situations you come across. It's more so about okay, I can spend this effort and do this now, but will I need this effort later, like when for a fight, right, or for you know some big event that's coming up. Um, so that kind that kind of strategizing is, I think, the main, uh, you know, the the main mechanic right of the game, really. Yeah. And something that I'm reminded of is when is when I when I would tackle the things like the roll and keep system that was used in L five R and Seven C, and most recently Heroes and Hardships. There is a bit of an issue with attribute and skill in that in that situation where there's a bigger benefit to getting at to getting attributes because in that case you're boosting both the roll and the keep. Um, with this setup, because of the fact that it looks like attributes 
grant dice and skills grant a static. Um, yes. What is it? Is it a case where the re the reason why you'd want to invest in sk in skills is to get more of a reliable result instead of a um, a throw? Uh, so yes, um, there's a multiple reasons. One, obviously, skills are, in terms of XP, a lot cheaper than a stat. Um, stats are very expensive because stat increases are, are, pretty, are pretty rare and powerful. Um, so, like, for example, like, a, a human being generally is going to, like, the maximum limits on, like, a stat, or on any of stats, right, um, are going to be between one and five, right, where average is three. Mm -hmm. So stats points are very powerful. They don't uh, go up super high. Um, so they're very expensive. Obviously, they're very powerful as well. Um, so skills are obviously a lot less expensive in terms of XP. So you can, you know, mo at the end of most sessions, you can increase the skill mm -hmm. by one, right? You know, um, and if almost every session, you're going to be able to increase something if you're going for skills. Stats, you really need to save up. The other thing is that... Um, yeah, they skills are obviously always because it's a flat bonus. They always are there, so you know that there's a minimum you can possibly roll if you have a certain amount of skill. Right? If you have plus twelve, right, and you're rolling three d six, right, you can never roll lower than a fifteen, and you know that. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing with skills that also is a big factor is that uh, the way help works in the game, like help uh, helping on rolls. Mm -hmm. Um, when you want to help on a roll. You can uh, you do skilled help and you do unskilled help. When you do skilled help, you spend one effort and you give them uh, the skilled rank. So I should say there uh, is a skill rank and then an, an, an equivalent bonus, right? So for example, rank two is a plus three bonus and rank three is a plus six bonus. Mm -hmm. um, whenever you help someone, you spend an effort and you give them the rank, right? So if you have rank three and a skill, you give them a plus three bonus. So having high skills makes you better at helping people um as well right because you've got more you know expertise it also helps with a lot of the perks uh, a lot of perk abilities uh factor with the rank of the of like a, a skill that you have mm -hmm. um so that interacts with that as well and uh also probably the biggest thing with skills is one of the categories of skills the trade skills right um which is your knowledges and like medicine and it's also um it's also like professions and there is a mechanic called the trade skill bonus where you can add the rank of a trade skill you have two roles where it makes sense that knowing that job would help you mm -hmm. right so i so i if you have uh the example i give in the book uh is you know if you're like if your character's like a lawyer right and they're trying to convince someone to take like a plea deal you have a rank three lawyer trade skill, right? Well, you'll get a plus three bonus to your role to convince this guy, right? Because, you know, you would be benefited by knowing what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, all of those things I mentioned are the main reason, like, skills are important to invest in. I've seen a lot of uh, players play it both ways, where they invest a lot in stats or they invest a lot in skills and, like, nothing in stats. Um, and I would say they're about on par, but strong in different ways. Mm -hmm. So, with that, in, with that in mind, I th one of the other things that c can come up with when it comes to Universalist is this is the whole idea of accounting for ver for various genres. Yeah. Whether the, whether the and with some with some genres, you do have some degree of supernatural power. So. It's time I address the elephant in the room. How are you going to handle magic or magic-like affairs for, you know, a sci-fi setting that's using s psychics? Yeah, so the way um the way that works is just because the so first of all, the kind of uh I guess vibe right be the word I'd use um the endeavor is going for it's obviously it is a universal system, right? They can do any amount of settings. But there is there is a somewhat of a tone it is going for, right? Um, which is more of a uh, like grounded kind of pulp action, uh, is what I would say, right? Like I said, you can't really do superheroes, right? Mm -hmm. But you absolutely can do magic 
within that, one of the things I said, one of the assumptions of kind of like grounded pulp action is that magic is not, you know, super common necessarily. Um, so the default assumption with that means that one of the heroic traits is magical. And that is the longest heroic trait in the game uh, in terms of, you know, how many pages it takes up to explain it. Because uh, there's a lot of mechanics to make it versatile. And the way that trait works... Um, basically you pick from a list of like origins, like what, why are you able to do magic? Right. And it's like, we're, it, it has a list of like, okay, you can do it just because it's, it's inside you, like you can do it. Right. Or you made a contract with like a demon or something, or, you know, you have like a wand and like arcane charms and all that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that determines your capability, kind of your capabilities. And also it gives you a special like weakness and bonus. And Basically, the simple way that magic works is you have a list of, of magic like effects you can do um, that you pick from a list. And whenever you say you're doing a spell, right, you need to spend an effort to cast the spell, right, before spending whatever effort you're going to do on the roll. Um, so since you lose an additional effort when you do magic, and you if you uh, you select what effect you're using, and then you make the roll using your magical power stat. So you gain a new stat when you when you, when you have magic, right? Yeah. Um, right. So basically, it works for the most part like a normal skill roll, except for the except for that you spend extra effort and you substitute your magical power. Um, except for you know for a lot of rolls for a lot of uses it's going to be a normal stat. Like if you're you know shooting a fireball at someone, then you're you're making an attack roll. That's pretty one to one. Um, uh. Oh god, what's one looking for? Uh, translation. Um, but there are also a ton of more in-depth rules for various things like summoning, right, or enchanting, or uh, like here's the obstacle to you know like it for for various like trying to see things supernaturally, like see through a wall or see the future, right? Um. So basically, there's an in a whole in-depth system for magic. Again, the default assumption is that you know one one player character is going to have is one player character is going to have that, but the whole the system is designed the way it's set up. It's designed to be robust to be used by you know multiple people or to be uh, used in a general sense. Um, so if in whatever setting you're playing, if everybody's magic, then you can just make everybody magic, and it will work just as good. Mm -hmm. Um. There's also, uh, working a bit differently, there's also, uh, separately, the Psychic Heroic trait, um, which I made its own heroic trait, just because it, I wanted to make it work differently in that it's not something you're, you know, knowledgeable of or focused on, but rather something that's kind of innate to you, um, and has more, uh, as it, it has a different set of mechanics, but kind of similar in that there's a big list of abilities you can choose from, mm -hmm. um, that give you various effects, like, for example, like you know, you can take telekinesis level one, which lets you you know lift stuff with your mind, throw that, you throw it around, and you know, slap people across the room if you want to, or like then you can upgrade that to like level two and you know stop bullets with your mind neo style, right? Or you know do other stuff like that, um, or you maybe you go for like you know, pyrokinesis or uh, you know telepathy, right? Or you know what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a personal favorite uh, that I've seen used a lot is level three divination uh which allows you to basically go back to the beginning of the scene uh as your character like receives the events that have previously happened as a vision um as you get to level three that takes up your entire heroic trait so it's you know it's a, it's a big cost for it but it's a really powerful ability uh that i've seen a lot of players use just because you know it's cool mm -hmm. there's also uh, oh i should also say uh this was a um, kind of late in the development edition, there's also specific rules for creating magical items. Um, and there's uh, several heroic traits and mechanics that are magic adjacent. Like there's a, uh, like, so there's a segment for creating like your own like character, uh, like races and species, if you're like playing an alien or elf or whatever. Um, and one of the abilities in that is like naturally magical, which means you get like a kind of a miniature, like less powerful, you know, magical ability. Um, so, depending on the type of game you're playing, it can be it can be pretty prevalent, um, and you can obviously take those mechanics and use them however you want. Yeah, I can. 
I can cer I can certainly get that. Now, with that with that said, when it when it comes to cre when it comes to creating adversaries, whether you want to call whether you want to call them monsters, NPCs, or what have you, are they built the same way that characters are? So they can be, uh, depending if you want them to be, but they don't have to. Um, do I have it kind of in the book. I have it. Sp you have. Oh, sorry, I got to get my words here. In the book, you have it split up into three different types of enemies. Um, you have basically your your goons, your extras, right? Mm -hmm. Who are they're not statted out like a player character. All you do for them is you just they don't have effort. They don't have you know a full stat sheet. Um, they just have here is the list of their stats and their bonuses, right? And then. You can, and uh, there's also a list of suggested perks if you want to like give them a perk or two to to make them you know make your goons act a certain way. Um, and those are there's a, a big section uh, in the book of like of sample uh, of like these like sample goons right for like various jobs. Um, so you know just like okay here's what a standard guy looks like and you just pull them out of the book, mm -hmm. or you can make their own. It's very simple. Uh, then you have elites, which are statted, which are statted out like a player character, with the exception that they don't have a heroic trait, right? So they're they're treated like a player character for every purpose, except that they don't have a heroic trait. Mm -hmm. um, and this is your boss, you know, your like boss encounter, right? Uh, they're usually statted out to have more XP than the player characters, right? And so this is your like boss encounter guy. Um, I will note uh, just something the way the mechanics work. Uh, is that I found interesting? Uh, is that, and this is something that uh, is true for all characters, uh, is that player characters and these enemies, by extension, scale in competence more than they scale in durability. Uh, player uh, characters don't scale in durability very much uh, at all in Endeavor, mm -hmm. um, which means that, especially in higher levels, you have characters that are very competent and can do like a lot of crazy stuff but you know a bullet's still gonna kill them right you know a bullet's still gonna hurt right if they get hit by it uh player characters are never really out of danger um that does have the effect that the kind of 1v4 raid boss um you kind of you'd see it like often like something like dnd um doesn't work as well uh, although it can work, if it's like if you're, you're standing out as like properly like a monster, then it works. But if you're ha but if your villain is like a human, right? Then you you know usually it's like you know the boss fight is them and their goons, right? Uh, to spread that damage around. But uh, yeah, anyway, so elites are like your boss fights. You know, uh, boss fight guys, you're you're the boss of the goons, right? It's got special uh, stuff. And then the last category of enemies is villains, which are your, you know, they're your campaign villains, they're your big bad evil guys. And they have heroic traits and more XP than the player characters. Mm -hmm. So they are like really powerful. They, you know, they have their own heroic traits, which puts them in the same, you know, tier as the player characters where they get that special advantage. Um, and they're really dangerous, right? Uh, you know, villains, because they have that same, you know, kind of advantage the players do. Uh, they're really they can be really dangerous and uh you know they they can they can get deadly for your, your players real quick um so yeah that's that's how it's statted out so most enemies you're gonna be fighting no they're not statted out a player character there's just a simple stat sheet um that you can just pull out of the book or just make it on your own really quickly mm. and then there is the option to go more in detail and make like a full character uh, out of an enemy if you want to mm-hmm so with that with that in mind that also brings up um how how to properly scale it cuz something that can happen with a lot of free form is not is there not really being any guidance to what would be a decent challenge for pe for people at at the level of progress that they are at that's something that you that's a little bit trickier to do when you don't have a defined level system yeah, like how do you figure out like what is a what is a good challenge for the players mm -hmm. without going too far? Um, yeah, so that's something that I've uh, that's something I'm and I've I have in a couple sections like uh, some basically tips on how to set things up. 
uh, for that. Like I said, I, like it in the NPC uh, like creation section, I, I do point out like, okay, here's an elite should be like one to two levels of XP uh, higher than the player characters and should have some like, guys with them. Um, same with elites, but more so. Mm-hmm. Um, generally, the if you're looking at something like a really challenging encounter, mm-hmm. um, generally the and I said what I was run by is the player character, you know, whatever whatever the enemy has, the player characters have heroic traits, and you know they don't. Right? So I find I found generally that um, if you're looking for like a really challenging, that if you put enemies that are about as skilled as the players up against them. It'll be a really good challenge, but the player characters come out on top because they have their heroic traits will carry them through. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that just depends on how much you want to challenge your players. Like if you're look, if you're you know, it depends on the game you're running, right? Because some people are going to want to run games where you're not expecting your characters to die at all. Some people might be running a game where the characters are very much in danger, um, and like could die at any moment. I will say, while it is, in terms of mechanics, while it is definitely possible for like an Endeavor character to just die, right? like at any moment, um, it in practice does not happen a lot. Player characters have, like I said, are very competent per their surroundings. Um, the way the, uh, the way the system is built, and they have a lot of ability to bail themselves out, both by heroic traits or by their perks, or um. You know, there's or by helping each other. Uh, Endeavor is in general what I've seen is that it's 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 a system where it's very easy for a character to get hurt, right? but it's pretty rare for them to die. All right, I can I can I can certainly get behind that. Now, move. I'm guessing I'm guessing that with it. Within that, there's going to there's gonna be some guidance as far as what heroic abilities, what perks, and so on might be better fits for some um, storytelling genres than others. Absolutely. So uh, one of the, um, this, I'm not I'm not sure this is exactly what you're asking, but but uh, just to give an idea. One of the main things is there. Uh, the book has a uh, three settings. It's split up to, into. Right? Just kind of by default, which is just pe- they're just you know kind of vaguely past, modern, and future. Uh, and a lot of the perks and abilities uh, are split up. The, all of the perks uh, and the heroic traits have a list of what settings you can use the tra- the trait of the perk in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, i.e., right? It doesn't make sense to you know have you know it doesn't really work to have your like you know perk that lets you shoot your machine gun faster in a medieval setting, right? So that's a you know that's a modern locked right uh, perk, mm-hmm. um, or you know there's like one of the uh, one of the perks uh, is uh, I just off the top of my head there's a perk called uh, electric desires right which is uh, it lets you implant more cybernetics than you normally are able to, mm-hmm. um, and that is obviously a future locked one right because you know cybernetics don't are are locked in future right. A lot of the, as you would imagine, the equipment is very, you know, locked to, uh, you know, the time period. Right? So you can't, you know, you can't, you're not allowed to take your laser gun uh, in the 17th century. Um, but there's also a lot of stuff like there's a list of cybernetics, right? There's like, like I said, rules for like magic weapons or equipment, uh, or, or like, you know, rules for vehicles, stuff like that. That is all you know, in its uh, kind of own place where it's like, okay, if you're having a modern game, this is the stuff that, like, you can use, and this is the stuff that's available to you uh, that makes sense. Um, In terms of, like, what abilities would be more or less appropriate, um, most of the perks and her traits really work for most settings. The only only restriction mainly is just you know, if you're playing a game that's set in the real world, then, you know, hey, you, you turn off, like, the, the obviously supernatural traits, mm-hmm. right? You know, stuff like being magic or psychic, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right. You know, or if it's, uh, if it just doesn't work for your world, right? You know, if there's, like, like one of the traits is uh, divine protection, which is, just, you know, God has your back, basically. Um, 
And that, like, there's a lot of settings where that just doesn't make sense, right? You know, so it's like, okay, right? You know, you can you can, you can ice that one, right? Uh, if you need to. Um, there's lots of examples of that. Yeah, so, it's, but... It's one of those yeah, things yeah, to... It's one of those things that's important to bring up, especially since, for for one... Um, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of universalist games will just throw all of the perks, skills, what have you, and that right in front of you and say, "Figure it out," um, with the excuse of this isn't this is more of a programming language than a game. Uh, but there's there's also the fact that not to, not um not every one setting within a particular genre is going to be created equal. You can have um. You can have two high fantasy settings, but they may ha but the way that they use magic may be so completely divorced from each other that th that um you, that a one size fits all can um couldn't be done. Yeah. Like imagine, imagine for instance, saying that the magic in say Full Metal Alchemist had to be used in, with the same set of mechanics as the magic in in say um uh, I don't know Mistborn. Yeah, that, was, that definitely would not even work. even though the only thing that they have in common is supernatural the, ability, and that's yes, it. That they are called magic. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know. I know the argument is it's not ma it's not magic. It's science when it comes to Full Metal Alchemist. But let's call a spade a spade. It's it's magic. It's magic. <laughs> I don't. I'm not even gonna hear that. It's alchemy is magic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. It, you know, it'll be when someone can do that in the real world, it'll be science. Until then, it's magic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, that's something just talking about like magic uh, stuff, like the, the way the magic trait works. You know, I, I couldn't really explain it in detail without like you know, pulling up the sheet and reading it, but um, it is wide and like versatile enough that you can cover pretty much a vast majority of, of things uh, with mm -hmm. that. Um, like you could definitely, uh, like you could definitely do the uh, the Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, like you could do alchemy in the magic system, for example. I know. Mm -hmm. that. In fact, I know exactly how you do that. You take uh, you take um, you take the origin where it's you have magical charms, right? And mm -hmm. your spell focus is the uh, the gloves they wear with the uh, with the alchemy circle on it. Well, because most the only, most the only alchemists most does... alchemists. Because most alchemists have to do it. You know? Every most people have to do a transmutation circle. Um, yeah. The only one who does it on their gloves is Mustang because of because of the whole snapping his fingers to make explosions thing. Well, I think uh, I think uh, Armstrong does as well because he has the the like yeah. Kestis gloves. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I forget I forgot about that that whole thing with Armstrong, the least subtle man in the history of subtlety. I said that's that's a hard man to forget. I don't know how you got there, um, but. When you have a bunch of systems running in your head, sometimes things get crosswired. Yeah, but yeah, but but you get the idea. Like the mm -hmm. point is, is like you know, most magic systems generally, unless they're you know, so so esoteric that they're you know, you can be on the ropes. Like most magic systems, I can confidently say, can be um, done by that. Um, <clears throat> I can say that uh, pretty confidently, just in a more general sense, that pretty much the way the mechanics are set up, I, there's enough variety. Kind of just a combination of generality and mechanical variety, mm -hmm. to where you can do uh, almost you know e everything you want with very minimal, um, with minimal tweaking. Um, like uh, just to give me an idea because I've played a lot of games of this. I've run a lot of games. I've played in a lot of games of it run by other people. Um, that are in kind of the playtesting circle, and uh, you know, I mean, we've run like. Anywhere from you know a fantasy again about a fantasy mercenary company, right, to a, a literal an actual Halo game about playing as like ODSTs, right, to you know a more like uh, um, Star Trek S space opera, to you know like a, a samurai tournament was like the first game I ever ran of the system, mm -hmm. um, to. You know, like a I had a, I had a one sh I had like a one shot about uh, playing as like hitmen, right? Uh, after like a target, um, like you can do a lot um, with the mechanics you have. Like even like I said with the Halo thing, even if you're adapting like an existing setting, right? Mm -hmm. um, that really didn't require 
pretty much any tweaking at all to to do exactly what we needed to do we needed it to do for that game um to give you an idea of like the versatility mm-hmm. and i'd like to put that to the test for example how would you handle um bending as seen in the in the avatar series bending interesting um the way i would handle that would be uh obviously that would be that would be using the magical heroic trait right um that would be the closest fit and the way you do that is you would take the background that is you know it's just a part of yourself you don't it is a part of your body essentially right you can you can do it naturally um then you would take the so in addition to effects there's also domains uh which is just like what you can uh you know it's it's stuff like water fire you know darkness stuff like like general categories mm-hmm. uh that kind of inform like okay when you're casting the spell what does this actually look like like what are you drawing on to do this um so if you're like a water bender right mm-hmm. um then i would take the uh yeah the like uh naturally like natural born magic user background for that uh, then i would take um as my one of my i think that give one gives you two domains i would take water and then ice right mm-hmm. Uh, for that. And then I would pick a list of effects, which for water bending would probably be attack, defend, and healing. Um right, would make those sense for water bender. Although you could you could change those out for other stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Um and as a character gets more XP, they could they can you can buy more domains to uh you can increase your power, you can buy more domains, you can buy more um effects, right? So you can expand that out a lot with XP. Um which in that case I'd probably do that to get more effects. Yeah. Uh, if I was like if I was making that character. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing if you're doing Firebender, it'd be fire. Uh, it would probably be the base one, and then uh, probably you'd extend that. To, you could probably take it like lightning as your second domain, um, or you could um, you could even for the domain you could. And this would be a bit of a stretch, like I will admit, but you could. Uh, I, if I was the GM, I would allow you to take like one of the kind of insetting martial arts, right, as like a domain for that, because they are very magical, right? Um, kind of in nature. Um. So yeah, I mean that's how I'd do it. I think that'd be pretty straightforward for the most part. Um, if you wanted to be very strict to to lore, you might need to tweak it around just to make the people have less domains than they do by default but even then i don't think it'd be it'd be very close just off base rules Mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind i'd like to i'd like to skew it skew this putting it to the test how would you handle different martial arts styles like how would you handle the the how would you handle it with how with someone who uses say um, Muay Thai versus someone who's using, say, Aikido. Yeah, so there is, um, so the basic combat skills are very general, right? So there's, there's four combat skills, um, and they're not exclusively used at, well, two of them are, but uh, two of them are more general. Um, there's four combat skills, which is, um, you know, melee attack, range attack, uh, reflexes, and footwork, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, you know, first two, I don't think need explaining. <laughs> Uh, reflexes affects your initiative and your ability to dodge ranged attacks. Uh, footwork lets you make rolls to like rolls to maneuver uh, your position and also defending its melee attacks. Um, it is a in terms of something I should say in combat. It is a range band system, so it's a bit more abstracted. Yeah. Um, and since so your four skills are obviously very general, right? So you you take those skills. You're uh, this is actually a specific line I use in the book. Um, you take those skills. You're a good fighter, right? but the way you differentiate is that there is a whole section of perks called style perks um, for a specific kind of weapon group, right? uh, w- of which one of which is unarmed attacks, right? Like uh, you know your fists, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a each style perk is a list of six abilities, right? When you take the perk, you pick two. Right? So even two people can take unarmed style and have completely different abilities from that. Um, and that includes they have right things like here. You know, let me, let me pull up. Why not? Let me just pull up PDF and like read that perk off to you right now. Um, 
do it live. Mm-hmm. Right, just to give you an idea. If I can get through my... Here we go. See perk list, combat skill perks. Yeah, so um, like if you took like unarmed style, right? You know, one person might take. Let's say you're trying to do boxing, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's what you're trying to. That's that's what you're trying to um, you know emulate, right? So then one thing you might, one ability, you get a list of two abilities in the list. So one you might take is uh, you inflict the dazed condition when you deal damage, when you successfully deal damage with an unarmed attack, right? So, you know, you are got those heavy hands, right? You're knocking the hell out of people, right, when you hit them, right? Um, and then the other one you might take, there's another kind of in a similar note, right? If you're, you're very Muhammad Ali, right, like float like a butterfly, is you inflict the winded condition when you dodge a melee attack, right? Right, so maybe you take the both of those, right? And so it's you know you're hitting hard, you're you're literally Muhammad Ali, right? You're you're floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's that's your boxing, right? Versus let's say another character, it's like you know they're good, want to be good at unarmed, right? But let's say it's more like a military like CQB type thing, right? You know, and that's their that's their like background for it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, then one of the uh, you might take the, another ability from that list, which is when you succeed a disarm roll, you can deal damage to them as if you you hit them with an attack, right? Mm-hmm. So you basically you know you break their rest, right? And you know so they drop their gun or whatever, right? Yeah. Or uh, another one, um, another one on that, right? Is uh, you can add your melee attack rank as a flat bonus to damage when you throw an opponent, right? Is another ability on there, right? So you break their wrist and throw them over your shoulder, right? Very grappling oriented. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, kind of martial art, right? Um, and then, you know, if you wanted to do another one, like, uh, uh, say, uh, let's say, like, let's say Kung Fu, right? Very striking oriented, you know, um, uh, martial art, right? Right, so one you might take is, one of the effects you can take is you can count your unarmed attacks as having a weapon quality, right? Because there's a list of uh, qualities you you give to weapons, right? Um, to kind of differentiate what they're like, right? So, and this is just a, that's a, both a mechanical and a flavor thing, right? So it's like if you have a sword, right? Um, you might give it the slicer quality, right? And say it's it's a scimitar, right? And that has both a mechanical effect, also just informs what the weapon looks like. Um, mm-hmm. But so let's say yeah, you're doing kung fu. Let's say you want. Let's say you t- you took that. You get you can count your unarmed packs having a weapon quality. Well, you count your armor packs having the long quality, which increases your reach, right? Right? Because you're doing, like, these really big, long, from downtown kicks, right? Uh, and these, like, far reach, these very far, uh, like, lunging punches, right? Um, so you're kind of using that to outreach people, right? Uh, or, you know, would it be another, like, uh, or, like, a similar thing? I think Kung Fu, like, the winded condition when dodging would also work for that, right? Um... Another one is uh, if you're doing like wrestling, right? Mm-hmm. There's another liability that, which is your reach counts as negative one when you're in a grapple. Um, basically, uh, melee weapons have a reach quality, so, and having more reach than the other guy helps you generally. It makes you better at defending. Um, unless you're in a grapple, in which case it reverses, and having a shorter weapon is better, right? So. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's like a, that's an example of it gives you uh, better defense when in a grapple, right? If you're doing like wrestling, right? As you're, you know, what you're trying to represent. So you get the idea. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can represent uh, with that, especially with the weapon quality one, because there's that, you know, that puts you on another table you can choose from, right? So, you know, there's a lot of inherent variety within that to pick and choose. Mm-hmm. I can, I can certainly get that. Now, within the full book, do you plan on putting any any sort of um, sample adventure or or bestiary that or that kind of example setup? Yeah. So, like I said, I have a segment on like sample NPCs already, and um, I do plan on having uh, 
two specifically I do plan on having two sample adventures uh that are in different like you know time periods just to kind of you know to to, to give a good idea of everything the system can do yeah I can I can certainly get that now what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the book so it'll end up being probably in close to 300 pages probably a bit under that um i would think let me let me take a look so i look at it now right i'm still working on the uh and the adventures that's something that's kind of the final thing i'm adding but uh yeah after adding that it'll be it'll be close to 300 pages mm -hmm. i can certainly get that so, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, per se, but a ballpark. Yeah, so I uh, have the, the Kickstarter going on right now, and that'll end at the end of December. Uh, and then, after that, I believe I had... Here, let me, let me check my thing, because I had set up the... Uh, there's a release window on the Kickstarter, I believe, but I want to make sure I do not contradict myself by accident. Uh, uh, yeah, so my, um, yeah, what I have in the Kickstarter is June of next year at, at as the delivery date I set. That's definitely a, you know, at the latest date. I'd like to uh, get it released earlier than that. Um, but that's my absolutely nothing could happen that would prevent me from releasing it, you know, before, uh, after June of next year. Mm -hmm. I can, so, and I will, I will certainly be, be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Okay, I appreciate that. But with, with that said... I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Well, I've, I've certainly been enjoying the madness. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I'll take that into account. Thank you for having me. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!